Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter, beginning with the 21st verse. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus began to say to all in the synagogue in Nazareth, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, Cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath and Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for being... God, all by yourself, for your great love, tender mercy, steadfast kindness towards us and towards all of creation which you have made. We particularly thank you this day for creating humankind in your own divine image after your own divine likeness. We thank you, God, for creating us, for redeeming us, for sustaining us and sanctifying us. We thank you for the gift of each other. We ask now that you would accept all of our repentance for the ways that we have treated other people wrongly, for our misguided thoughts and our hateful words. We ask that you would continue to turn us around on this life's journey to love as you love, unconditionally, and eternally. Speak to us now, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My sermon text for this morning is the second lesson assigned for today, namely 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. My sermon title for today is The Biggest Word of All. The biggest word of all. The Apostle Paul founded the Christian church in Corinth, a city in ancient Greece, at the conclusion of his second out of three missionary journeys, according to the chronology found in the book of Acts chapter 18. He stayed there in Corinth about a year and a half doing ministry. It was there he met a couple who would become good friends and partners of his in ministry, namely Priscilla and Aquila. Unfortunately, Paul's most contentious relationship that he had with any of his churches was with this one here at Corinth. It was a fairly chaotic, turbulent, and dysfunctional congregation, riven by strife, envy, and competition among them concerning, of all things, spiritual gifts. Paul's two letters to them amply reveal his frustration, impatience, and at times outright anger. His pain veritably leaps off the page. Paul is writing this, his first letter to them, sometime in the mid to late 50s in the first century, while in Ephesus, some 250 miles east of them, across the Aegean Sea. Like most of his letters, Paul's concerns here are chiefly doctrinal and ethical, meaning what the people believe and how they are behaving. 
This letter is primarily famous for two absolute gems of writing. The first, chapter 13 here, Paul's famous hymn on love. And the second, chapter 15, his famous treatise on resurrection. Indeed, if all we had of this correspondence was these two chapters on love and resurrection, that itself would be inspiration enough. The chapter before us today is worthy in its own right, but even more beautiful and sublime when taken in context. It is, of course, most familiar to us, for better or for worse, pardon the pun, because it is often recited as the scripture of choice at weddings. It is indeed a remarkable celebration of and instruction on human love. But it is also, chiefly, a reminder of divine love placed midway in a block of three chapters concerning spiritual gifts. The people of Corinth are arguing among themselves, you see, concerning who is the best, the brightest, the wisest, the most influential, the most gifted, the most important, etc., etc., etc. And to that end, Paul writes chapters 12, 13, and 14, trying to explain the various spiritual gifts that God gives, to rank them, as it were, and to communicate that all members of the church, though individuals with differing gifts, are part of one body. And that body is in need of all its various members. All gifts are given for the common good, which is the benefit of the entire body. It is a lesson relevant for every age in Christianity. The Super Bowl will be played in two more weeks, and the victorious team will be presented with the prestigious Lombardi Trophy. That trophy is named after Vince Lombardi, the legendary coach of the Green Bay Packers. When he was a new coach of the Packers decades ago, he addressed his team thusly. Gentlemen, he said, we are going to relentlessly chase perfection, knowing full well we will not catch it because nothing is ever perfect but we are going to relentlessly chase it because in the process we will catch excellence. I like that in proper context. Relentlessly chasing perfection in order to catch excellence. After an entire chapter, chapter 12, of trying to calm down these Corinthians and properly explain things to them, Paul concludes in his very last words, before the words that we have before us today, but strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Today's text is one of those rare texts which largely stands on its own. To really attempt to dissect it is almost to do it a disservice. It is remarkable poetry. But it is helpful to understand a couple of things. It has largely a threefold structure. Uh, verses 1 through 3 explain the necessity and the primacy of love. Verses 4 through 7 define the essence of love with both positive and negative descriptions. You can see there what love is and what love is not. While verses 8 through 13 contrast the eternal perfections of love with the temporary or time-bound imperfections of all other gifts. Love is complete and perfect, in other words, while other spiritual gifts, though important, are partial and transient. Eugene Peterson, in his message, remix, paraphrase translation of Scripture, renders part of the middle portion today like this. So, no matter what I say, what I believe, or what I do. I am bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel. Love takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. 
the scripture of 1 Corinthians 13 is not alone in testifying to us that nothing in the world, nothing in our lives, nothing in our religion, nothing in our faith is more important than love. It is absolutely central. Everything else is peripheral by comparison. God is love, John writes in his first epistle. For God so loved the world, he writes in his gospel, that he gave his only begotten son. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, Paul writes in Romans. No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends, Jesus says. The greatest command of all, Jesus said, is that you shall love the Lord your God, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. A new commandment I give you, Jesus once said, that you should love one another. Love your enemies, he taught in the Sermon on the Mount. The fruit of the Spirit, Paul writes in Galatians, is love before going on to list eight other things. Perhaps the greatest greeting and benediction ever bequeathed, Paul writes, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Love, Paul writes, is the fulfilling of the law. Every single commandment is summed up in this one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Above all else, Peter writes, maintain constant love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. There is no fear in love, John writes, because perfect fear, perfect love rather casts out fear. And love, Solomon once wrote, is as strong as death. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can floods drown it. So faith, hope, love, abide, these three, Paul concludes today. But the greatest of the three is love. One commentator noted that love is greatest here because faith and hope are our responses to God and what God has done, while love is who God is and what God has done for us. Another notes, faith will one day give way to sight. Hope will one day give way to reality and experience. But love, love gives way to nothing. It is always love. It is always eternal. It is always God. A couple of weeks ago when our nation was celebrating the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, I remembered several years ago when a local newscast was interviewing people who were out volunteering in their communities, adults and kids alike, and asked them about their thoughts and reflections on Dr. King. Uh, most were standard and predictable, dealing with nonviolence and social justice. But one child in particular, probably seven or eight years old, offered something different, funny, and profound in one simple sentence. She said, he uses big words to help people. He uses big words to help people. Needless to say, I was tickled. Probably having heard a speech or two of his and not understood it, she was undoubtedly referring to his rather extensive vocabulary. After all, not everyone would encourage unity and community by declaring we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. And yet she also knew that he was helping people by his choice of words. As we all know, words are important. In a National Geographic article a few years back concerning the history and experience of Native American Indians and the oppression that they have endured uh, historically in our country, a man intriguingly remarked, after years of suffering abuse at the hands of those who were cruel and oppressive towards him and his people, do you know what saved me from becoming a cold-blooded murderer? My language saved me meaning his native language. There is no way for me to be hateful in my language. It is such a beautiful, gentle language. It is so peaceful. 
there may be big words in any language in terms of numbers of letters and syllables and difficulty in pronunciation and technical meaning. But another definition, my friends, of a big word could simply be that it's large and spacious in terms of meaning and implication. Even though it has only four letters and is composed of one syllable, I submit to you today that love is a big word. As much as we overuse it in shallow, superficial context, we also underuse it in godly and divine context. There is no greater force on earth than love, my friends. There is nothing more salvific, transformative, and upbuilding than love. You were created in love, redeemed by love, and sanctified by love. When you were formed in the womb, you were loved. When God chose you from before the foundation of this world, you were loved. When all of the days of your life were recorded in the Lamb's book of life before any of them as yet existed, you were loved. Indeed, the Greek word for love in this text today is agape, perhaps the biggest word of all. Agape means unconditional love. Can you imagine that, my friends? Love without condition. Much like these Corinthians to whom Paul writes this morning, whether we behave well or poorly, God loves us without condition. Whether we believe correctly or incorrectly, God loves us without condition. Whether we build others up or tear them down, God loves us without condition. It's not that God doesn't have preferences for our lives. God certainly does. He is a God of grace and mercy, of justice and righteousness and peace, and the ark of the universe certainly bends that way. But Scripture says He makes His sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Agape love is a huge word, my friends. It is large. It has capacity. It has an openness and an inclusivity almost beyond our comprehension. It is without condition. It exists regardless of acknowledgement or response. Law is a big word, all right, but love is bigger. Sin, likewise, is a big word, but love is bigger. Death is a huge word, but love is even bigger. Failure, a big word. Disappointment, another big word. Shame, guilt, depression, Loneliness, all big words, but love is bigger than all of them combined because almost all of them are us. They involve our actions, reactions, emotions, feelings, and experiences. They are all of this created world. But love alone is of God. Love alone is God's character and nature and essence Love alone is God's word on us, over us, and through us. Love is the one word you can't stop. Love is the one word you cannot deter. Please take a brief moment now to open your bulletins up to page number 5. To today's scripture, to the second lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you are in-house, please take a moment to... Open your bulletin to page 5. If you're online, please take a moment to scroll to it. And I want to give you a few seconds because I need you to clarify something to me. Once you have it, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, look at verse number 7 of that reading. Let me know when you have verse number 7. Verse number 7. What, tell me what love bears. What does love believe? What does it hope? What does it endure? When does verse number 8 say it ends? I'm sorry, when? When? If others don't love you, you are loved. If you don't love yourself, you are loved. Because God loves you, He loves you without condition, He loves you forever, He loves you eternally. Do you know what stops us as Christians from being cold-blooded murderers? 
our language, our Christian language. It is beautiful, it is gentle, and it is peaceful. And the biggest word of all is love. And when we use that word to help others, we use the love with which God loves us to love others. And as it concerns this love, we relentlessly chase perfection, knowing full well we will never catch it because we will never be perfect. We will never love perfectly. But we chase it nonetheless because in the process, we will catch excellence. We can and we will and we must and we do in fact love excellently. We love with excellence. The biggest word of all. The biggest word of all. Amen.